All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're with Dr. Joan A. Friedman. Thanks for joining. This is a little bit different episode. Usually we're talking to an entrepreneur. You're obviously an entrepreneur. You have your own books, but you're also an expert in an interesting topic. And so we just wrapped an episode of Cake's Body. So two twins who started a company together, two female twins. And now this is, you've devoted your whole life. Tell us what you do. Give the window into oh, your okay. future and what you're... So I was born an identical twin when many twins were not around. And I think parents still, and back then, don't really know how to address certain concerns that twins have. So I grew up as part of a couple. Basically, my sister and I, we had a big house. We could have had our own room, but it was like a couple's room, you know. When you double. say a couple, you mean like literally a couple. So like boyfriend, girlfriend, married couple. Well, well yeah, because yeah. we were in this room with two beds, you know, two sinks in the bathroom, monogram towels with J on both of them, okay. you know, <laughs> desks that were built in, the closets. I mean, yes, it could have been for a couple. That's incredible. And you actually okay. are often treated as a couple because nobody's interested, engaged, or aware of your needs for being your own person. Um, so you sort of have to stumble through your life in different different times and transitions. It's different for everyone. But for me personally, it happened when my sister and I, we chose to go to different colleges. We were so sick of spending 24 hours a day in the same room with one another. And, you know, you live in a twin bubble when you're, and you don't know anything else. You wanted to uncouple, Well, but, decouple. but you don't know any, you don't really know you want to decouple. You know you want to get away, but you don't really know or understand what that emotionally is going to mean. So, because you grow up in a twin bubble with certain things being the way that they are and then you get out into the world as a singleton and you're ill-equipped and unprepared for a lot of social challenges that you never got to learn because you were in your twin bubble. So my sister did fine. She went to her university. Her roommate became her surrogate twin really and she's still best friends and that's wonderful. Well I went to college and I, and this is all in hindsight of course, repeated my twinship function, which was I was a caretaker. And this is a whole big issue I don't have time to go into, but lots of times in a, in a twin relationship, one person takes on the caretaker Like a student role. teacher. One will be or caretaker, caregiver. So one gives, one receives? It's, a, it's more, it's a good question. I always think that people understand that, but they don't. It's like, it's being codependent in a, in a very unhealthy way. Like one person in this very close relationship grows up really being vigilant about what does my twin need? What does she want? How does she feel? What do I need to do to make her comfortable? And again, you don't have to be a twin to be codependent. Anyone can be codependent. It's just, it's a... In psychology, they call it a pathological accommodation, which means you give up yourself in order to accommodate to the needs of another. And most twins who are doing this, many don't. I have to say that I only represent twins that are having problems. I want to I want to put that as a caveat. A lot of twins do not. So I'm not speaking generally. Just people who find me, who I write my books for, who are struggling with certain conflicts. It's certainly not everybody, because a lot of twinships are healthy. So in taking on this function of a caretaker, I went to school looking for the most depressed woman that I could find, and I found her. Okay. And it was <laughs> I was very unhappy, wow. um, and then I transferred to school in Boston, and I worked some of these things out, but I didn't work a lot of these things out until I started my psychoanalytic training, because well, you have to be in analysis four times a week, you know, lying down, this was the old way, and I started reading about twinships in the psychoanalytic literature, and they were all very, like, you know, crazy, like, the, the, you know, this is a masochist, they're psychotic, you know, it, it didn't have any understanding about what what is a normal developmental timeline for a twin. Nobody sort of was talking about that or writing about that. It was all sort of very unhealthy. And I looked and looked and looked, and I wrote, um, I went to another psychoanalytic training, I have two dissertations. So I was looking for stuff that people like me could read without the psychoanalytic jargon that would really lay out a developmental timeline for what it's like to grow up as a twin. And it's not the same as growing up as a singleton. Sure. There's somebody you've been in the womb with all that time. There's someone you're compared with. There's someone who they may or may not be able to know who you are, you're confused. 
it's really a tough parenting situation, especially if these are your first children, to be able to take care of two infants at the same time while you're adjusting emotionally to parenthood. So it is really, really tough. I'm so glad that my twins were my last ones because had they been my first ones, maybe I sure, wouldn't knows? have had any more. When it comes to people, like how do they find you? At some point they, so if I'm a new parent and I have twins. Yes. Okay, so it's an interesting phenomenon where you're saying you got to keep them together. They have to share a room almost like a couple. How do people find you? Do they say, all right, I have twins and now I have to go, I have to go do some research on how do I raise them? Right. Well, they sort of Google twin okay. expert. Okay. And my name comes up. I have to tell you that I have You're to pay somebody. Expert. I pay somebody to do Instagram. I, I don't even know what Instagram means. Okay. I don't put anything on it personally because it's unethical. So all my stuff is psychological. No pictures of me or anything else. And then I, every Tuesday, I do Twin Tuesday, I do a video. But I started writing blogs. That's how I first started. I don't even know if anybody reads blogs anymore, but that's... Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> so that's how I started before all this. And what I, year did you start doing that? Well, I started when I started my first book, which is 2008, and my the person was helping me, the PR person, I, I didn't even know what I was getting into. I'd never done any of this before. I still don't. But she said, well, you, know, you have to write blogs because that's the algorithm and you have to get people interested in you. And then I, I started doing also some going around and speaking to Mothers of Twins group, which was, I was so fearful of public speaking. It was the hardest thing I had to conquer. I, I remember what you said in one of your podcasts that you have to do the thing that you're most scared of in order to be able to proceed. And it was, for me, it was the scariest the thing. The public speaking. Yes. Okay. Yes. And then eventually it became easier. And I'm so passionate about what I speak about that now it's like, they yeah. can't shut me up. Yeah. But, but that's how You're people the find me. You're the subject matter expert. And when they find you, what is it the one thing, like what's, what's the first question they ask? Well, it depends. You want a mother? Of, a mother. A let's, mother. Go, let's go with the mother. Oh, okay, the mother. <laughs> all right. So the mother of twins finds me and says, they're fighting all the time, or one is doing much better than the other or one has more friends and the other one's feeling left behind, or one's taking one's friends from the other twin and there's all this conflict. So it's usually about, also the biggest question, should I separate them in the classroom? That's a very big question. Separation's always like the major number one issue. And is that a yet, what is your You know what, advice? it completely, there's not one answer. It's a case by case basis. It depends on the kids. Right, it, some are twins. ready. To transition, some would be traumatized if they were taken away. With a boy-girl twin, often girls are like bossy because they cognitively develop sooner. So lots of times, if it's okay, it's good to put the boy in a separate class because the the twin just mothers him to death. So okay, there's girls are bossy. Good to know. Breaking news. <laughs> Apparently, they catch up later. The boys catch up. <laughs> they later, catch up but, later. Yeah. yeah. But the adult twin issues are amazing. They are, my twin has a romantic relationship and I'm left out. My brother's getting married and I am so devastated because I can't believe my brother chose a woman over me. Mm -hmm. So there's this real, it's, almost yeah. like a rejection. Oh, it's, it's beyond a rejection, Diego. It's a betrayal. It's, it's an absolute betrayal. Twins grow up with this sense of, loyalty and connection and this idea that they're going to be with one another forever and when one splits whether it's a, gr a girl for a boy whatever the identical twin thing is they're devastated they're devastated they're angry they're enraged they're betrayed they feel absolutely abandoned it is so difficult i know people are so so shocked that this happens but the, that's the most number one problem what people find is that they cannot cope after there's an, a third person and now there's a triad. How do they get through that? And so do they have to both agree to come see you? Well, you know, one usually comes because the one who's left out comes. And of course, the one who has the relationship feels terribly guilty that their brother or sister is suffering, but it's like, I deserve to be happy, don't I? So, Of course. But, but There's there, a defensiveness but, there that isn't healthy. But their guilt really does interfere with them really, really exuding happiness. So the one who's kind of left out comes to me, and he or she is, you know, not chosen, feeling 
like no good, like all this stuff about how they grew up being compared and a lot of competition kind of, you know, gets in the mix of our sessions together. So they have to really work through and they have to find their own sense of self inside. They have to feel the like self. they're good okay. inside. Because in the twinship, okay. they weren't the good one. It's a process because working on the inside oh takes a long God. time. That's heartbreaking a little bit. It is heartbreaking. And so for the one in this scenario that was, let's say, the quote unquote good one that mm -hmm. found love, mm -hmm. are they able to love freely in their relationship or mm -hmm. do they also sort of struggle? Well, it depends because if they love freely, then they, they can't really love freely because now they're also being disloyal to their partner. Right, right. So, so they're caught in they're, this, they're, this and balance. And they often have to choose. They have to choose between their partner and their twin. I mean, I had that experience somewhat. Like, and my sister and I married very different people, and our husbands did not get along. They, they're, they, it's okay <laughs> now because we're older. Nobody cares anymore. That's funny. We care about other things. But initially, they, they didn't get along at all. Okay. And that totally affected our relationship. Of course. And so it just, it's bound to happen. And some people get through it easier, and some people are very traumatized. How do some people get through it? I, I can imagine one scenario is they just geographically choose different areas to live. So maybe one moves to LA, one's in New York. Yeah. Maybe that's a part of it. And unfortunately, what that often leads to is estrangement f from one another. Because, you know, if you can't handle conflict, then how are you going to work out the estrangement? So, And twins have so much trouble with conflict. In order to deal with conflict, you've got to be a separate person, right? You've got to be able to sit back, hear what your twin has to say, try to be respectful, not respond. But twins have such conflict when they acknowledge how different they are because their differences mean they're no longer connected. So it's a wow. very complicated process. And so do you help them through that? Yes. Okay, so you focus more on the let's sort of realign, let's establish the differences, your own, your true self, I guess, maybe. You bring them closer to that. Yes, and also trying to help them be accepting of where their twin may be with their other. With their own life. And yeah. try to focus on themselves and, and finding their own lives. Do twins have a superpower? Like, like for example, I think of the Brian brothers for tennis. Yeah. Right? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I think about Casey and Taylor, who we just interviewed, mm -hmm. who now have a $100 million business. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And so where do you see twins have having this crazy superpower that the world can never understand. Where do you see that? I think, like, I, I, watching the Brian twins, they have, it's called, like, twin synergy. Okay. It's like knowing somebody so intimately that you don't have to talk. It, you know, you know each other. You can look. There's all this nonverbal communication. You kind of know how the other person's going to think or feel or respond. So in the good cases where it works well, it's great. But there's a lot of twins who go into business who believe they have this twin synergy, and it definitively ends up that that does not happen. And it, they, 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 okay. they can't do a business together, and they break apart, and they have a lot of trouble. Is the synergy something that exists? Is it like a black swan event? So is it very rare, or is it... Let's call it uh, two out of ten. It's like maybe 10, 20 percent of the time. I think it depends so much on how twins were raised. Yeah. If twins were raised with parents who were really able to acknowledge their uniqueness and their individuality, then they could be raised as two separate individuals who were able to really appreciate one another and work well together. But if you're not raised in that kind of separate way, then so often you're, you are competitors. Mm -hmm. You're connected, but you're competitive. And that's when the twin synergy gets it can be destroyed. Bad. It's funny. So, so we were, when we were just interviewing them, I asked them, I was like, well, how do you guys view your superpower maybe as twins? Here you are, business partners. It seems like things are going well. You seem to have a great rapport with each other. I've interviewed them a few times, and so I've gotten to know them a little bit. And they said it's because they have the same values. Mm. And so I said that's, that's like a marriage mm -hmm. in some way. Like a married couple with the same values will be far more successful than a couple that has different values. It's because they agree on the big stuff. 
And so that's what they, that's their superpower. They, they have the same values, which was interesting to me. I was like, oh, you guys really do operate like a married couple. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's great, but I don't think that can account for everything, right. the same right. values right. in couples. But yes, I think it's a very important point. You know, twins have a lot of trouble with outsiders because they expect immediate intimacy because that's what they've grown up with. They've grown up with someone who understands them like in the blink of an eye. And when they have to go out in the outside world and start dating, I've had so many twins tell me, oh my God, I have so hard to, he has to keep listening to me. I have to keep talking to him. He doesn't get me. He does it's like, they expect to be like gotten just like their twin gets them. Right. So almost it's non-communication. It, yeah. It's yeah. like they have to work a lot harder. Okay. They're not used to it. What's another reason people find you? Like at what point of their lives were there, so there's marriage, right? So there's a couple, there's parents that find you. Yes. Another big issue that people don't know about is twin loss. That is a huge issue. People don't understand that losing a twin is probably, it's, I hate to, I, you can't compare loss, but it's not like losing a sibling. Losing a twin to so many people is like they've, they have lost a part of themselves. You know, they look in the mirror and they see their their twin and they're devastated and their mourning period is so long. And it's especially long when twins have been like each other's most important person, whether there has been, you know, uh, another intimate other, they're still each other's most important person in the world. And when one is lost, the other one is lost. They have um, international support groups called for twinless twins, but it, it's very much people will say to a twin, why is it taking you so long to get over, you know, the loss of your twin? What's, what, what's with it? And so they have to deal with a lot of backlash about people not really understanding how difficult it is. And it's oh, different. That's got to be so hard. Yeah. And so you work with those groups as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go back to that. So we, we know what a, mo a mother asks you. What does a father ask you? Father of twins. Well, I, I, I don't see that many fathers, um, okay. but but I do. I do <laughs> see not? when I'm doing Zoom, and sure. the parents have have come to me. They're on Zoom. The father is usually there. Okay, but they're not the ones that are approaching you first. You're saying actually, in, in a few cases, the father is the one that reaches out, maybe because he's having the most trouble with what his wife's doing or needing some understanding. I think p parenting, when you have twins and you have a father who's involved. You are so fortunate because in those initial period, people say like six years to a month is just a blur. They don't even remember what their kids were doing and they feel really bad. But if their husband's there and there's another pair of hands, it's so really, it's wonderful. So much of what I advocate is one-on-one -on -one time with twins. And everyone, when I first brought this out as an idea, I got all yelling and screaming, I don't know, if I want to get away, I don't want one-on-one -on -one time. But that's the key, I think, to a healthy twin relationship, is when each parent can spend some one-on-one -on -one time with each twin. twin individually. Because that okay. gets, you get to know them, you get to know their personalities, and it's not a lot of time. I'm not advocating, because parents don't have a lot of time these days, but... You know, just a half an hour, you take one to the store, you take one to the market. Like when I had my boys, Johnny and David, I took them everywhere separately because the idea of oh, reliving wow. my experience, like, oh, you're a twin? Oh, who's older? Oh, who's bigger? Oh, who's who? I mean, the idea of having to go through that was, was so awful that I always separated them. And what it also does is, and, and parents are so reluctant to do this, it builds resilience. If you as a parent don't provide opportunities for them to be alone, either with a parent or in an activity or in a classroom, how do they make friendships? Twins have terrible time making friendships, but it makes sense. It makes sense. Because they don't have the chance. They just stick to each other. That's right. And yeah. it, they are so, if I could tell you, the, the stories that I get, like twins have gone to the same college. They're fighting over twin groups. It's like they're two <laughs> years old and they're fighting over toys. Right, right. Because nothing gets resolved. Because they didn't understand, right. The whole developmental timeline of twins is so fascinating. Because yeah. you've got to see it like that, not see it like... In some way, that's the else. work. Because they're going to do all the same things anyway. Because they're two siblings who are the same age. So if they're on a team together... Or if they're playing the same sport, they're well, going to be on the same team anyway. And so you no, might you're as well not. I put Johnny and David on different, on different teams. teams. Oh, you're smart. 
well, I had to. I did you everything. Knew, you knew. Well, I did everything because I didn't want them to repeat. I, what I did, I was so extreme. I, I don't purport people to do what I did because off the charts. Okay. Um, really. <laughs> okay. It was. I mean, I don't want to tell you what I did, but, you know. It, I, did you I did put them it. in different rooms? Yes, they had different rooms. Okay. They were on different right away? teams. Right no, we had okay. to wait until my, our older son went to college. We didn't have the, the room. The space, but, got right. it. They were always in the same school, but always different classes. All the teachers were go, Dr. Freeman, why do your boys come in and tell me they need to be in a different class all the time? We don't understand. But they went on different overnight camps, different day camps, different community service places in different countries, and they hated it. One, Johnny was so shy, he was always miserable. David was miserable because he was homesick. So it wasn't like they loved these experiences. But what it did was it prepared them to go to college, to different colleges. And all five of my, my kids had trouble adjusting to college. I think people are not, are not really honest about the adjustment. It's pretty hard for some kids. So it was so hard for them. But because they had had the experiences before that they were like able to you know, kind of feel that resilience inside of themselves, they coped. Otherwise, I think, you know, Johnny for sure would have come home. Do you still learn a lot about yourself in your own journey as you deal with different couples and different parents, different twins? I do. That must be quite a journey. It I is mean, a just journey. to kind of learn a little bit, oh, I remember that. And then here you are, you got to experience yourself as a twin and then as a parent to yeah. twins, which is wild. No, and I think it's like, it's so helpful for them, my patients, to know I understand pretty much. And because I'm so much older and I've been through sort of all of these life stages, they feel very understood. They don't feel judged. They're judging themselves because they feel that twins should not have problems and twins should get along. So they're already being so judgmental toward what they're going through. Okay. With twins, is, is it that they can just go to different therapists and maybe they learn about themselves, identify their own issues, well, or it is it like, together? Like one, a mother reached out to me and said, could you see my daughter? She's struggling. And I go, you know, a, a 20-year-old, which are my favorite, those, those young adults. Why is that? Why is a 20-year-old your favorite? Oh, because they're, they're facing so many struggles all at the same time okay. that they're so available to their feelings and they're okay. struggling with relationships, okay. struggling with career goals, struggling with separation right. from their parents. A lot of transition and happening. You know, it's a, such an amazing growth period. So I do love that age. So I started working with her and I adore her. And then the mom said, you know, can you work with her sister? <laughs> and I said, no, I cannot. I said, she's my patient. And if I were to start to work with her now, that is so counterproductive to the uh, the association and the relationship that I'm building with her. So that often happens. Or older twins come in together as couples. And I'll see them together like like a couple. Like a couple. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And so to see them individually is, is right. I get it. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. So Professionally, just, it doesn't just, make any sense no. to see one and then switch over to the couple. No, it doesn't. And then lots of times the parenting consultations, I'll just see one, I'll see the mom or I'll see the mom and dad together. And I do those rather quickly because... There's just so much I can help in a consultation. What's the coolest thing people should know or like the wildest thing you've learned on this entire journey about twins? That it's hard <laughs> growing yeah. up as a twin. It's not like, oh, you have ESP. Oh, you're soulmates. Oh, you're, you know, you're going to live forever. You're never going to be lonely. You have a best friend. That's what I want people to know that that may be true for many people, but for those twins, who don't have that kind of an experience, there's help for you. And you just need help, and you need to understand why and what you're going through, and your life will be happier. But this living up to that stereotype and that mm. hype it makes me nuts. I believe it. Really it really makes me nuts. And you're on your third book, and your fourth is coming. But my fourth is coming. What's your fourth book about? The fourth is going to be <clears throat> a bunch of my writings that I've organized in different categories, like parenting, uh, twin loss, um, young adult twins, older adult twins, adolescent twins, something that's going to be a, a sort of a quick guide for someone to sort of look up and look at the chapter and go, I need some help on my adolescence. Okay. So that's what it's going to be. A more be. digestible version. I exactly. Almost like a cheat code <laughs> to it. And yes. at what point do people call you? Do they say, okay, help me out. I'm in trouble. What are they when is the earliest you'll get involved with, with, let's say, twins? Oh, when there's postpartum depression. Okay. What else should people know about <laughs> you and all your research? I don't know. I'm not good at, I've never been on TikTok. 
<laughs> and I don't plan to be. Yeah. And I don't know. I Instagram, I pay someone. I don't even know what the followers mean. <laughs> someone posts what I write on LinkedIn. You know, I was born before all this stuff. Sure. And I don't, I don't need a brand and I don't need... <laughs> and the way I make money yeah. is by people finding me and right. I charge them for my expertise. Absolutely. And I didn't go into this to make money, but it's nice that I've been able to. I'm not an entrepreneur. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So yeah. I, I don't know. I don't plan to ever do anything else than what I'm doing. <laughs> I love that. It's, it's simple so, in that way. It's simple. And, and it's, it's honest. And it's also... It speaks to you. It's also something I can manage myself. I send out all my bills. I make all my appointments. I make all my Zoom contact. So I'm, I'm in charge of it, and I feel in control of that. Well, so... So Look, thank you for coming on the good. podcast. Well, you're I've learned a lot about <laughs> twins. It's always so interesting for me to interview people like yourself that have spent a good amount of time delving into subjects that I know nothing about. Well, it's very sweet of you and, and to have me, especially since I don't fit the criteria for the normal guest. No, this so is I'm so good. very much thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Joan A. Friedman. Appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, share with your friends, your family, or anyone you might think might benefit from the conversation we've had today. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We'd greatly appreciate it. Your feedback helps us improve and reach more people who can benefit from our discussions. The best way to stay connected with us and get the latest updates on future episodes is through our social media channels. You can find us at Startup Storefront. We'll be back next Tuesday with another great episode. See you then.